While the incredible success of Bitcoin and DeFi was both significant and obvious in 2020, the story with the greatest long-term implications may well be the comparatively quieter growth of stablecoins and CBDCs. Facebook's Libra project had a relatively quiet year. Certainly, it was much quieter than it would have been if they'd launched as originally planned. Instead, they had what might be described as a year of transition. The Libra Association gained some members and lost other ones, there were a fair few personnel changes, and Libra underwent a renaming, with the Libra Association becoming DM Association, and their subsidiary Calibra becoming Novi Financial, presumably in an attempt to further distance themselves from Facebook and the project's early iterations that demanded so much attention from regulators around the world. Most interesting of all was DM's change in approach, which was outlined in their updated white paper. They now plan on issuing multiple different digital currencies, pegged to different government-issued currencies like pounds, euros, and dollars. This would set DM up to provide the payment rails for CBDCs when countries are finally ready to release them. In their white paper, which was released before their rebranding, DM said, Our hope is that as central banks develop central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, these CBDCs could be directly integrated with the Libra network, removing the need for the Libra networks to manage the associated reserves and thus reducing credit and custody risk. As an example, if a central bank develops a digital representation of the US dollar, euro, or British pound, the association could replace the applicable single currency stablecoin with the CBDC. But while watered down, their dreams of a digital currency based on a basket of existing assets and currencies isn't dead. Their new money would be formed by aggregating each of their stablecoins in some fixed ratio, and it would only be offered in countries that didn't have monies represented on DM's platform. And to further appease governments, they say that they would welcome the oversight and control of the basket composition, both the currencies included and their respective weights, by a group of regulators and central banks, or an international organisation like the IMF, under the guidance of the association's main supervisory authority. DM is now hoping to launch in 2021, and although it's not nearly as dramatic or ambitious as originally intended, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on this year. There was a time when stablecoins were simply a tool used by crypto traders to move funds, and escape volatility without leaving the ecosystem. But they've become increasingly important as time has gone on. Today, stablecoins are the default trading pair for most crypto assets, they provide a lifeline for unregulated or offshore exchanges that struggle to access the traditional financial system, and they provide a way for people in countries with weak currencies and strong currency controls to access dollar-like assets. 2020 was the biggest year for stablecoins so far, with their total market cap growing from a little under 6 billion at the start of the year, to more than $28 billion by the end of 2020. As you'd expect with that kind of growth in supply, the on-chain volumes for stablecoins exploded in 2020 as well, rising from around a quarter of a trillion dollars in 2019 to more than $1 trillion in 2020. That incredible growth was driven by a flight to safety after Black Thursday, the rise of stablecoin collateralized derivatives as traders moved away from BitMEX, and the yield farming craze of the DeFi summer. But stablecoins aren't all about crypto trading. Because they bring many of the same benefits as Bitcoin, albeit in a slightly weakened way, and they combine that with the assurance of stability, stablecoins can make bottom-up dollarization in countries suffering economic and monetary crises that much easier. Last year, we got a taste of how impactful stablecoins can be when USDC and AUSD were used to distribute funds in Venezuela. The funds originally belonged to the Maduro regime, but they were seized by the US in 2019, who released them to the Guaido government's account at a US bank. In an effort to get those funds to the people that needed them in Venezuela, the Guaido government used them to mint USDC, which were then sent to RTM, a bank and blockchain connected payments platform that operates throughout the Americas. RTM converted the USDC into their own stablecoin, AUSD, and distributed that to Venezuelan healthcare workers, who could either spend them using RTM's virtual debit card, send them to other users, or withdraw them as bolivars at their local bank account. The beauty of this system is that the Maduro regime has no way of preventing payments, despite tight controls over the traditional financial system, while users only need a mobile phone and an internet connection to send and receive payments. Obviously, this system isn't a solution for all of Venezuela's problems right now, and it's only helping a relatively small number of users, with something like half a million people using RTM in the country. But it's a start, and when you see traditional banks like Wells Fargo dropping support for Zella, a popular payment platform in Venezuela, then the potential of crypto dollars is clear. Venezuela is dollarizing, some 64% of transactions in the country already use dollars. Today, most of those payments are physical, but in a few years' time, it wouldn't at all be surprising if they were predominantly digital and mostly using stablecoins. 
Outside of Venezuela, Circle spent much of 2020 laying the foundations to expand USDC usage outside of the crypto industry. In March, they released USDC bank accounts and APIs that would make it easier for businesses to use and receive USDC. Then in December, they partnered with Visa to add USDC payment capabilities to their credit cards. Meanwhile, we saw some major companies entering the stablecoin game, such as JP Morgan who finally announced that their fiat redeemable JPM coin was ready for usage. They also created a new blockchain unit called Oinx because blockchain solutions could become a real business for the bank according to their head of wholesale payments. JPM coin was originally envisaged as a way to enable faster and cheaper cross-border payments, and it's apparently already being used by one major international company. While this isn't a public-facing service at present, it will certainly be interesting to see how the project evolves, and it will also be interesting to watch the bank's efforts around CBDCs, as they're reportedly looking to provide the payment rails for them. Unsurprisingly, all of this activity around stablecoins has attracted the attention of some rulemakers. In early December, three House Democrats unveiled the Stable Act, intended to regulate stablecoin issuers. If approved, the bill would essentially force stablecoin issuers to become a bank, massively raising the barrier to entry and therefore reducing innovation. Some broad interpretations of the bill would even require Ethereum node operators to attain banking licenses in order to process stablecoin payments. Luckily, this bill is unlikely to ever become reality, but it shows that stablecoins are starting to become a truly noteworthy sector of this industry. A more positive example of the attention stablecoins are receiving came as the US Office of the Controller of the Currency released guidance that opined that federally chartered banks could hold reserve assets for fiat-backed stablecoins. While this may sound like a relatively minor announcement, the guidance provides a degree of certainty for banks that were unsure of the situation, and so it can only be a good thing for stablecoin issuers. Central bank digital currencies could be one of the most important stories of the next decade, with potentially massive implications on freedom, privacy, and monetary policy. The original announcement of Libra and the news of China's CBDC efforts have acted as catalysts for central banks and governments all over the world to start investigating their own digital money offerings, and 2020 brought many developments on this front. While the US is far from leading the charge towards CBDCs, they're clearly considering one. The Federal Reserve made multiple comments about them throughout the year, and published a thorough review of existing literature on CBDCs in November, which made it clear that there are still many options on the table when it comes to their implementation. One of the loudest voices calling for the US to launch a CBDC is former CFTC head Christopher Giancarlo, aka Crypto Dad. In January of last year, he launched a non-profit called the Digital Dollar Foundation to support efforts towards and advocate for a central bank digital currency for the US. The Digital Dollar Foundation released a white paper in June that argued that the country needs to start seriously considering how it would implement a digital currency and discuss the key characteristics it should have. The foundation also managed to make itself heard at three separate congressional hearings, so it may have a significant influence on things moving forward. Europe seems to be a bit further along in its efforts. Sweden, for example, launched a trial of its e in February, though they're only using simulated users rather than real ones for now. France launched an experimental program to test a digital euro in April, while a representative of the central bank said in December that there would be more experiments to come, and that they could lead to regulatory changes down the line. Meanwhile, the Swiss central bank and the Bank for International Settlements were expected to begin tests with their own digital currency implementation before the end of the year, paving the way for experiments with retail-facing CBDCs in the future. The most significant CBDC stories on the continent have come from the European Central Bank, who formed the Eurosystem's high-level task force on CBDCs in January, consisting of representatives from more than 20 European Central Banks. In October, they released a report on a digital euro saying that they needed to be prepared to issue one should the need arise, laying out four scenarios that would necessitate the launch of a digital currency, including the broad uptake of CBDCs issued by foreign central banks. Later in the year at the ECB Forum on Central Banking, ECB President Christine Lagarde said a decision on whether to pursue the launch of a digital euro would be made in January of this year, and that her hunch was that Europe would press ahead with it. If that happens, she added, the proper launch of the currency would probably take between two and four years. We're also seeing a degree of international cooperation between central banks as they combine efforts during this research phase. In January, the Bank of England formed a group with the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, Sweden's Riksbank, the Swiss National Bank, and the Bank for International Settlements to assess potential use cases for CBDCs. In October, they published a report detailing how digital currencies should be designed. They outlined foundational principles and core features of CBDCs, such as stating that they must coexist with and complement existing forms of money, and be convenient, low-cost, and highly available. Some nations are much further ahead in their efforts to release a CBDC, with a couple of countries actually doing so in 2020. In October, the Central Bank of the Bahamas officially launched its sand dollar, 
a digital version of the Bahamian dollar that is intended to improve access to regulated payments and financial services for underserviced communities and socioeconomic groups, while increasing the efficiency of transactions in the country. At an event shortly before the launch of the sand dollar, a representative of the country's central bank said that while the currency would only be usable in its domestic setting initially, they were working to make it interoperable with international currencies. That same month, Cambodia's central bank launched its Hyperledger-based payment system that has been described as a payment backbone as opposed to a CBDC. Whatever it is, they hope it will combat dollarization in the country and make it cheaper and easier for migrant workers to send money back home. By far the biggest and best known experiments in CBDCs belong to China, who stepped up their testing efforts in a big way in 2020 as they aim to become the first major nation to release a CBDC. The People's Bank of China hopes that their CBDC, officially known as the Digital Currency Electronics Payment or DCEP, will help internationalize the yuan and reduce the US dollar's dominance. They've even described digital currencies as a new battlefield of competition between nations. DCEP pilots began in multiple major cities in 2020, with the most famous tests involving tens of thousands of participants who received red packets containing about 200 yuan. In November, the PBOC's governor said that these tests had resulted in more than 4 million transactions being made, moving over 2 billion yuan, or $300 million. The biggest test of the year began in Suzu in December, time to coincide with a major year-end shopping festival called Double Twelve. The city gave away 20 million yuan via a lottery, again in the form of thousands of red packets worth 200 yuan each. This experiment was bigger than the previous ones in every way. There were more participants, more money given away, more stores to spend the DCEP at, more major companies like JD.com and ride-hailing giant Diddy taking part, and more major banks supporting the DCEP wallet. It was also the first test of the currency's offline payments, though fewer than 1,000 of the total 100,000 lottery winners were able to try this feature. While it seems that the country is expected to continue experiments for some time, China is clearly close to a widespread rollout of the DCEP. Huawei wouldn't have launched a phone with a built-in DCEP wallet if that wasn't the case. This is going to be an incredibly important story to watch over the next year or two, as will the response of other governments and central banks, who will likely find themselves under increasing pressure to launch competing initiatives. So that's it for this video recapping 2020. If you want to see some others in this series, uh, I'll put links to it in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, have a great day, and I will see you in the next video.